third degree price discrimination. So in the first degree price discrimination, what is it that we have seen? That uh, monopolist can charge different price from different customers. You come to me, I'll charge a different price. Somebody else comes to me, I'll charge a different price. But don't you think it is such an information overload on a monopolist? I will have to know your demand function in reality. I, I should be knowing your demand function. Then only I can uh, uh, charge a different price from you. Well, but there is an easier way through this. So instead of charging different persons different prices, what I can do is that I can segment them into several segments. Maybe if an old person is going to come to me, I'll charge him a lower price. If a young person is going to come to me, I'll charge a, a, a higher price, let's say. Or if a student is going to come to me, I'll charge a lower price. If a non-student or a working person is going to come to me, I'll charge a higher price, something like that. So when it is, when I am dividing the market into identifiable markets, separable markets, then it is easier to follow third degree price discrimination, right? So let me just write a point about the first degree price discrimination first. That is in the first degree price discrimination, monopolist has to know the demand function for each and every customer, which is an information overload for him. In first degree price discrimination, monopolist has to know the demand function for each customer. Right, that is an information overload. That is an information overload. So you can, uh, what do you call? You 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 can substitute this with some other less stringent requirement. What is that? That you can probably just segment the markets into few identifiable markets, right? Monopolist can also segment the market into few identifiable markets, right? Into few identifiable markets. For example, mm, old people, young people, Right. Old people, young people. You are coming from India or abroad. Right. Or student versus working. So when monopolist 
monopolist uh, divide his market into few identifiable segments and, and charging different people different prices. For example, if you're old, I'm going to charge you lesser. If you're young, I'm going to charge you more. If you are in India, I'm going to charge you lesser. If you are from abroad, I'll charge you higher. If you're a student, I'll charge you lower. If you are working, I'll charge you higher. So I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm not burdening myself to know about each and every one of your demand function. No, 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 no. What I'm just doing is that I'm, I've separated you into several segments. And when I do this and I charge you different price for the same product, what I, what I follow is what is called third degree. price discrimination, right? Third degree price discrimination. So I can follow a separate price policy for each segment. So I can follow a different price policy for old people and a different one for the young people. And of course, this is, uh, this is uh, also very important that these identifiable markets are also separable. are also separable markets, right? So for example, um, your uh, student or working. So if I'm working and I go to a monopolist, how can I show that I'm a student? I mean, looking at me, nobody thinks that I'm, I'm going to be a student. Uh, so they need a student ID card, something they would always need. And uh, so I'll have to pay a higher price. So there is no reselling which is allowed. Right. Or if somebody is sitting in abroad and uh, he wants to buy an Indian economy edition of certain book, maybe he can't buy. It's not that easy. Right. Because one, that edition is not going to be sold to you. So for the same price in the Indian market, the price is lower. But in the foreign market, for the same book, the price is higher. Right. So there also. They have, uh, they have created this kind of price discrimination policy. And why do you think they, they actually uh, get into this trouble of, of making so many prices or so many different prices or charging so many different prices? Because this increases their uh, profits. It can increase their profits. I'm not saying it will definitely increase their profits, but yes, they can. So let us say there are two markets. So assume that monopolist had identified uh, two separable markets and uh, the demand function for the first market is P1, Q1. And P2, Q2 is the demand function. for market two, right? So how do I write the profit? Pi Q and Q2 is revenue in the first market, which is what P1 Q1, right? Q1 plus revenue in the second market, which is P2 Q2 minus cost. Let's say my cost is C as a function of capital Q. So let me just write a few more things out here. This is capital Q is, that is the total output which is produces, output produced in the market one plus output produced in the market two, right? But what is the demand function here? This P1, sorry. This P1 is a function of Q into Q1. This P2 is a function of Q2 into Q2. So I don't think I should be writing this guy. Not as this thing. Um, so some books, they also write the demand function as uh, F1, Q1, and you can just write whichever way you want. So C, Q1 plus Q2. Right. Now, 
del pi by del q1. So there'll be two first order conditions. So I have two endogenous variables here, q1 and q2. So I'll be finding out uh, the condition for the first market and the second market separately. So del pi by del q1, how will I do that? So that is uh, that is first function as it is into derivative of second plus second function as it is into derivative of first with respect to q1 minus c dash q1 plus q2 is equal to zero minus c dash q1 plus q2 is equal to zero and guys this is what is your mr function also this is also your mr1 function also this is also your mr1 function so we have already done this but uh, let me just write that also so tr1 is what p1 q1 into q1 MR1 is what? DTR1 by DQ1. So it's first function as it is into derivative of second plus second function as it is into derivative of first. P1. Right. So this is nothing but MR. And what is this? This is MC1. This is MC1. Right. Del pi by del q2. Same thing. P2 q2, first function as it is into derivative of second. The second function as it is into derivative of first. Minus c dash q1 plus q2. Equals to zero. This is MR2. This is what your MC2, right? This is what MC2. Hmm. So, so what do you have out here is, but if you look at it, your MC1 and MC2, they're not different. If you look at it, your MC1 and MC2, they're not different because this is just your, your uh, C dash Q1 plus Q2. C dash, C dash is a function of Q1 plus Q2 into derivative of this guy with respect to Q1, that is one. So these are same things. So it is just MC. You can just probably just write this as MC. Just MC. So if I would have written C1 Q1, C2 Q2, then writing MC1 and MC2 makes sense. So if I would have written the cost in market one is C1 Q1 and the cost in market two is C2 Q2, then it becomes uh, imperative that yes, you should be writing like that. So otherwise, the idea is this. Uh, that is at equilibrium, MR1 equals to MC and MR2 equals to MC. At equilibrium, MR1 equals to MC and MR2 equals to MC. Right. So what do you have? Hmm? What do you have? MR1, this could be very easily written as what? Tuk, 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 tuk. Acha, you tell me one thing. Just going back here. Can I just take what? Your uh, can I just take this guy? Your uh, or should I write this? Can I take just your P1 common? P1 common. So it becomes what one plus Q1 by P1 DP1 by DQ1. I can write like this this MR1. Right. But this could be very easily written as 
uh, one plus this is nothing but the inverse of elasticity. But elasticity of demand is a negative number, so I can write like this also. I'm writing it E1 just to show it is the market term, right, beta? So this we have done in the earlier recordings also. So I'm not spending much time on that. So basically what you have is this guy, one minus one upon modulus of elasticity in market one into P1 should be equal to MC. And for MR2, it is what? P2, one minus one upon modulus of elasticity. Two. This should be equal to MC. And since MCs are same, I can write like this. Since MCs are same, I can write like this. And I can also write like this. So this is basically P1 by P2 is uh, one minus one upon modulus of elasticity in market two, all upon one minus one upon modulus of elasticity in market one modulus of elasticity in market one. We can write like this, right? That is, uh, I've written it wrong. Da, 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 da. P1 by P2, oh, oh, or P2 by P1. This is your uh, P1 by P2, this guy, that's right. So just think about it. If, uh, how should I say, even, modulus of elasticity one is greater than modulus of elasticity two, something like this, right? So what happens is one upon modulus of elasticity of one would be less than one upon modulus of elasticity two. You can write like this. Okay. Uh, so it would mean if I just take minus of both the sides, then this is going to change. Hmm? And I can write this as one minus so C one would be greater than one minus modulus of elasticity two, right? So your denominator is more than the numerator. So in that case, your P1 would be less than P2. P1 would be less than P2. And this seems to be right. This seems to be right. So this guy is more elastic. This guy is less elastic. So the price is going to be more in the market in which is less elastic. And price is going to be less in the market. Which is more elastic. Which is more elastic. You can also look at it uh, this way. So 
let's say for example, I have two markets. Right? So you have market one, market two, price in market one, price in market two, and MC is same. Let's say like this, right? Well, market one is more elastic, something like this. So this is the demand function of market one. And this is the corresponding MR function for market one. But market two is less elastic. This is the demand function for market two. And this is the corresponding MR function for market two. All of this is MC. Now you tell me, it should be easier for you to think. MR equals to MC here. So the price which is going to be charged is this. MR equal to MC here in this market. And the price which is going to be charged is this. So in market one, this one is going to be produced at MR, MR1 equals to MC. And this is the price. In market two, this much is going to be produced at MR2 equals to MC. And the price charged is small. Right? So for the less elastic market, this is less elastic. market and this is more elastic market. So for the less elastic market, your price is going to be higher, but for the more elastic market, price is going to be lesser. Price is going to be lesser. I just sometimes what may happen is something like this. Mm. So you have Q1, Q2. MC. Rise of 2 MC. This is what MC is. Right. And in this market, the demand is this. And MR function is this. Right. And in this market, demand is this. And MR is this. Right. Now just think about it. Why on this earth, I being a monopolist will serve even market one? I'm not able to cover my cost as well. I'm not able to cover even my cost. So in such a case, in such a case, uh, sometimes a very small group will not be served. Sometimes a very small group is not going to be served at all. Right? Uh, the monopolist is only going to serve, let's say, the second group. So sometimes A small group for example here market one will not be served will not be served right Monopolist only serves
market too right so because willingness to pay of market one is very low so it is not profitable for me to serve that market willingness to pay for the market one is very very small right so this is what is called third degree prices combination huh so thank you beta